Hello and uh, welcome. Would like to start in a sh uh, short while. Um, for those who have uh, joined, uh, thank you for joining in. And uh, today we are going to talk about uh, what we call PUD or peptic ulcer diseases. Um, we are going to have this uh, webinar uh, 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 presented by one of our doctors. Uh, it's called James Waidaka. And um, we hope that you enjoy this. Uh, in case you have any questions, kindly put it on the Q&A section. If you have any challenges, uh, you can send us a chat. In case you want to talk at the end of the webinar, kindly raise your hand and we'll allow you to talk. Uh, I can see a few people who have joined. Uh, Aleo, uh, Lillian, uh, thank you very much for joining. And the rest who are joining us from all walks of life. Um, without further ado, I uh, would like to hand this over uh, to James. However, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the other panelists. Uh, we have Wanjiru Nyambura, who is uh, one of our um, uh, practitioners at Sasa Doctor, and she runs the clinic uh, admin uh, in terms of administration, the, all the, our clinics. Um, I'd like to just uh, say here, uh, we have uh, several clinics. We have four clinics, uh, one in Nakuru, one in uh, Kakamega, and uh, two in Nairobi, uh, one at uh, somewhere called um, Kariobangi at uh, the uh, roundabout on Outer Ring Road. And then the other one is in Westlands near the roundabout of um, the main roundabout on uh, Ring Road Westlands uh, at one mini house on the fifth floor. So if you want to talk to us, uh, you can use the application. We have an application both on iOS and uh, um, Android uh, uh, stores. You can download, register as a um, patient and then you can use it remotely, especially in these uh, challenging times, you can use the application to be able to consult with a certified doctor or practitioner. So we offer a wide range of um, um, uh, services, uh, not just uh, 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 consultation. We also deliver medications, we do M labs, and we have even COVID-19 monitoring programs where we are able to actually advise you without you leaving the comfort of your home or office. So uh, from here, I would like to talk. Um, Onjiru, do you have something to say before we can start? You can welcome uh, uh, our participants. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our afternoon webinar. Uh, kindly, uh, we, we were a bit late. Apologies for that. Next time we're going to do better. Uh, so welcome. And today we are going to discuss about peptic ulcer disease and the means around it and how to treat it. So um, I'm sure by the end of the webinar, you have learned a lot. Thank you. Um, on, the other side, on the other side, on the other side, we, side we also... Please. Uh, on the other side, we have we have um, Harrison, who is in the technical department, and uh, he's going to welcome you all. Harrison. Yeah. So um, I'd like to like to welcome uh, everybody on this uh, important conversation about pep peptic ulcer disease. And I hope you're going to learn something from it. Welcome everyone. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Um, now I'd like to now introduce James uh, Waidaka, who is a practitioner as, uh, at uh, Sasa Health Limited or Sasa Doctor Virtual Medical Clinics. And he's going to take us uh, through this. So, James, you can unmute yourself and uh, start the presentation. Yes, thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is uh, James Mwangi Waidaka, and I'm, I'm glad that I'll be presenting to you about the peptic ulcer disease, or what is commonly known as PUD. So thank you very much and uh, welcome. 
So we start uh, with the objective of this presentation, uh, which is first uh, to be able to define PUD at the end of the session. Then you'll be able to explain how PUD can develop. Also, you'll be able to list at least signs and symptoms suggestive of PUD. Then you'll be able to point out the management goals of the PUD. And then you'll be able to name complication of PUD. So to start off uh, is to understand what uh, PUD is or what peripheric ulcer disease is. Now, just as a definition is a disease characterized by an open sore on the lining of the upper of digestive tract. And in this case, we are talking about the stomach and duodenum. The duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. As you can see on your right side, uh, in relation to other structure or the, uh, the, the organs in the, in, the, in the digestive system. And the open sore uh, wound is the, what we are referring as an ulcer. And it breaks the continuity of the surface of a lining of a structure. Now, under normal circumstance, we are having a system, what we call a digestive system, that is protected uh, as it performs its function. So normally it, 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 is, it, is, it has a protective mechanism from the corrosive nature of whatever it's holding. For example, the digestive juices, uh, the, the, the corrosive uh, uh, stomach acid and, uh, and like. And for it to be able to perform its function, then the stomach and the duodenum have to be protected against these uh, destructive forces. So when that breakdown of that protective mechanism is, is, is breached, then the tract itself become compromised and it can be, uh, uh, it can be injured by this uh, stomach acid or digestive juices. But the body will try as much as possible to restore any abnormality or any injury that occur due to this. And that timely restoration of the protective mechanism will minimize any development of any ulceration or any wound on the lining of the stomach. But when this uh, is of contrary, when these destructive forces, the stomach acid and the digestive uh, uh, juices outweigh this protective mechanism, then uh, there's a risk of developing ulcers. And we are talking about uh, there being excess acid in the system or the protective layer, which is a mucoid uh, nature on the lining is broken down and the rate at which is being replaced by the body is very low. So when that is outweighed, then the ulcers start developing on the lining of the stomach or the duodenum, as you can see on the right side of that image. Another thing we have to consider is that uh, PUD or peptic ulcer disease are more in males uh, th than in females. And this can be attributed to other factors, for, uh, for example, the risk factors that we're going to, to be looking shortly. Another thing to note is that stomach ulcer, which is part of the peptic ulcer disease, is more, uh, uh, more in the person age uh, over 60 years and above. And this also can be explained in terms of the risk factor and uh, probably uh, other factors that we're going to, 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 to be looking shortly. Then duodenal ulcer is more in person age 30 to 50 years, and that also will, uh, we are going to, 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 to link that to the risk factor that we're going to be looking shortly. Now, I, I would love to share uh, a quick uh, snapshot of a study that was done in, in regards to um, upper abdominal uh, complaints, uh, which PUD is part of. And this study was done, uh, it was a, it's a comparative study which was done in Nairobi and Nakuru. And uh, it, it was found that peptic ulcer disease was among top three. Actually, the duodenal ulcer was number two and the stomach ulcer was coming at number three. So this means that peptic ulcer is a, is, is a, is a problem that we encounter in outpatient uh, basis where the patient complain of, uh, of upper abdominal discomfort or pain or signs and symptoms that are affecting that part of the body. Another thing to, uh, to note here is that 
between duodenal ulcer and the stomach ulcer, the duodenal ulcer tend to be more prevalent uh, than, than stomach ulcer, that, uh, as you can he see here. In all the cohort in Nairobi and Nakuru, duodenal ulcer was more uh, prevalent than stomach ulcer, something to note. And probably this, we will uh, relate this even as we discuss the risk factors. Going on, so what are these risk factors we are talking about? So the first thing that uh, is very most common cause of uh, ulcers is what we call an uh, infection. And one notorious bacteria is what we call H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori bacteria infection, which uh, pre present uh, in most of the cases uh, where patients uh, have been confirmed to be having the, the, the ulcers. So this H. pylori is a bacteria by nature and it lives in the digestive tract. And it's very common, half of the population have it. And the way it is uh, transmitted is via uh, oral, uh, fecal oral route. And it tends to increase with age. As you, uh, from, from childhood to, to, to adulthood, you increase the, the, the rate of infection become more uh, uh, prominent. Again, uh, most people with H. pylori doesn't mean that will develop ulcer. But those who do develop the, 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 the ulcer, it's because the bacteria now has increased the amount of acid in the stomach or duodenum. And uh, the inflammation of the lining of the digestive tract become prominent. Remember, the, the body will try to get rid of the bacteria. And when it tries to do that, the inflammation ensues. And this inflammation can be destructive in nature as much as it is helping to, to, to eradicate the infection. And also during that process, there can be a breakdown of protective mucus layer. So when, all, when we combine all of these factors, then it's high likely that an ulcer can develop. But not all H. pylori infection equals to development of the ulcer because the body can, 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 take, can take care of it and uh, prevent uh, that from happening. Going on, uh, the prevalence of H. pylori is high in complicated uh, cases of ulcer, as we're going to see how, how, how does patient present when they have a complicated case. But it is significantly low or lower in uncomplicated ulcer disease. Another the factor that we have to consider here is that the duodenal ulcer, 8% of the duodenal ulcer have H. pylori infection. And the 70% with stomach ulcer have H. pylori infection. Basically, the, uh, this means that more than half uh, of, of people with ulcer, be it duodenal ulcer or stomach ulcer, more uh, half of, of, of them or more of, uh, of them have an H. pylori infection, making H. pylori as a bacteria or as infection uh, the most common cause of these uh, peptic ulcers that we are talking about. So moving on, the, the second most cause of the peptic ulcer is certain drugs. And the most notorious one that is causing this is the drug that we normally use in pain management. These are painkillers or analgesics. And the one uh, in specific is, is, uh, is in class of NSAIDs, or what you call non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And these are come second after uh, H. pylori infection. And the NSAID cause changes in terms of how the protective uh, mucus is, is, is applied in, in terms of the lining of the stomach. So it the kind of destroy that uh, uh, reproduction of that mucus that protect the stomach and the duodenum from this corrosive forces of the content of the, uh, of the gut. So, uh, you, you might ask if uh, at all if the NSAID or the painkiller is causing this, uh, if it's necessary to take them. Yes, because not every person who is taking these drugs might develop the, the answer uh, by, 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 by themselves. But uh, it will depend on multiple factors, and this factor include which kind of NSAID uh, the, the person is using. There are certain NSAID which are more specific in terms of their mode of action, how they act in your body. And when they are so specific, it means that they, 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 there's a low risk of you uh, having to develop these uh, peptic ulcers. Certain uh, drugs are more general in terms of they, don't, they are not non-specific. 
That means as much as they are doing their work in the body, they will also affect other normal function of that body in terms of um, uh, maybe uh, mucoid production that protect the stomach. So in that case, it interfere with that uh, mechanism. And when that mechanism is interfered with, then the general protective mechanism of the stomach and the duodenum is affected. So the other thing that uh, we will be considering when using this NSAID is the dosage that you're using and then the duration of the use. It means that the longer you use, the more likely you are going to develop, de develop these uh, ulcers. Another factor is psychological. And it's psychological in terms of probably the stress, the anxiety, and the, the depression. And you can see here, it's, it's, it's a, a likely uh, psychological factor by themselves, they may not directly cause the ulcer, but when you have one, maybe due to the, the infection, H. pylori infection, or even uh, uh, the NSAID that we have talked about, they now can contribute uh, for, for, for the ulcer development or increase the development of the ulcer uh, when you have this psychological factor, or even impair the healing uh, of the ulcer, and it can also increase the chances of recurrence. So by the same, they may not cause, but they, they may affect and influence how the ulcer will behave. Another factor that can be a risk is genetic factor. And one of them is family history of, of peptic ulcer. When a one member or two members have this history of peptic ulcer, it's highly likely that one, another member may, have the, may experience the same or develop ulcer. Another is blood group O. Uh, the, the reason of this is not clearly known, but it has been found that those people who have blood group O, be it positive or, ne or negative, they have, ha ha they have a high likely chance of developing ulcer, maybe due to, to, to other factors that are known, but also if you have other uh, the risk factor, for example, the infection we're talking about or NSAIDs. And then we have the lifestyle factor, and the most common cause of this uh, part is smoking. Smoking can directly cause the answers. And then we have alcohol abuse. Alcohol abuse in terms of excessive uh, intake of alcohol can also uh, 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 aggravate you developing some of these factors. Another uh, thing that I can add there is food, in terms of spicy food, there are certain food, but food by themselves may not directly uh, make you develop the answer, but may interfere in terms of healing and uh, even its development. Now, going on, what are the suggestive symptoms of peptic answer disease? We are calling them suggestive because and not all the symptoms that probably that you're going to talk will link directly to uh, you having answers. So because some people uh, with answer may not have any symptom uh, as it were, and we call that a silent answers. They don't present anything, they, they don't have any symptoms, and, and, and yet they have the answer. Those who experience the symptoms may complain of having upper abdominal pain or discomfort, and the patient will tend to describe the pain as burning or hunger-like feeling. Others will complain of feeling uh, they are quick, uh, they are feeling full quickly when eating. They can't continue, they, they just have a bite and then they, uh, they feel like they, they, are, they have had enough. Then uh, others will complain of stomach pain that is associated with belching or feeling bloated after eating. Then Anna will complain of heartburn and acid reflux, which most likely is associated with water brush. Then Anna will have nausea, and Anna will even have vomiting. Remember, this symptom can occur in solitary or in combination, and it depends with an individual. And in vomiting case, you might even have blood in the vomit in severe cases, as we are going to see shortly. Other symptoms include blood in stool, and the blood in stool may make the stool appear in terms of color, black or tar-like. So it's very important, uh, especially those who have silent answer, to, do, to not only check the, the whatever that is getting in your body, but also whatever is getting out of the body. It's good to check your stool, because when you see this kind of changes, uh, it might be indicative of something wrong. And then we have duodenal answer, 
which tend to cause abdominal pain that comes several hours after eating. And normally this kind of ulcer, a uh, patient will complain that they, they are woken up at, during the night with the pain. And they tend to take something so that they can relieve the pain. Now, this is a, a, a little bit different uh, from when you are having uh, maybe stomach ulcer. Stomach ulcer, the pain of the stomach ulcer may start immediately or shortly or minutes after having a meal. And the, the patient will complain that they don't want to eat because the eating tends to make them feel bad. And this kind of, uh, of ulcer may even tend to uh, the, make the patient now have what we call uh, loss of appetite. They don't want to eat because of that fear of the pain. And that can now lead even to weight loss as compared to duodenal ulcer where they tend to eat so that they can relieve the pain. So going on, uh, when you're having all these suggestive symptoms, how do you confirm that you, you, you have the, the peptic ulcer? So the first thing is your history, what you tell the doctor. Though the reviewing that history and the symptoms that you're presenting is very important in diagnosing the cause of, the, or, or, of whatever you're experiencing. And when you have that history and symptoms, which are highly suggestive, they raise index of suspicion in, uh, in such a way, it will necessitate that uh, a test uh, be done to determine or even to rule out the presence of answer. And one of the test that we, are, uh, we normally do is what we call upper endoscopy. And uh, the upper endoscopy is the most common uh, diagnostic uh, tool that uh, is commonly used. And basically it's, it's a thin flexible tube that is inserted in the mouth down to the throat and it has a light and small camera at the end that will enable to project the image of the lining of the stomach and tell if there's any ulceration or any abnormality that can be seen. The good thing with this upper endoscopy also is that uh, one can be able to take part or a tissue on the lining of the stomach so that it can be subjected further, uh, probably to test for that H. pylori infection that we're talking about or any cell changes in terms of is there any cancer kind of cell change that is occurring in this particular uh, area? So it's become a very uh, crucial test when uh, we are talking about PUD. The second one is the barium swallow. And this involves uh, uh, taking or swallowing a thick substance containing a barium with the X-ray, series of X-ray being taken as the, 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 the swallow goes down your uh, food pipe. And remember this barium is uh, radiopaque so, such that when the X-ray is taking, the digestive tract will be able to be seen clearly. And where there is a, a, a wound, it will just go there and the, 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 the X-ray will, will pick it. Now, this is a less common test, but it may be indicated to some patient. Another test uh, that is normally carried is what you call h pylori testing the bacteria which is most notorious in causing the, 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 the answer that we are talking about. And uh, the test uh, can be done through the breath or a stool sample. The breath is normally you are given a solution which is carbonated, urea, and uh, when you take it, uh, it will be digested by this uh, bacteria and uh, break, breaking it down to carbon dioxide that now you are going to breathe it out. So you measure that level and it can indicate during uh, in terms of the ranges that, 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 that are there. Then we have the stool sample, and this stool sample, it measures the characteristic of the presence of the H. pylori by itself. It is antigen-based, and, and uh, this becomes very important because when this becomes positive, it means you have an active infection. We have also blood tests, which is also available, but this is not reliable because it is based on antibody, uh, antibodies, uh, antibody-based. Meaning that uh, it's just um, a blueprint, meaning that you, you had, a, you had a, a H. pylori infection probably six months ago, one year ago. So it might be positive, but it is a, what we call a false pro positive. So it's unreliable in that. So most commonly we use the stool sample and the breath. Another thing to note is that uh, 20 to 25% per, uh, per of the patient with the symptoms suggestive of the peptic acid disease are found on investigation to be having the answers. So that's something that you have to know. Not all the symptoms that you may experience are indicative of you having an active ulcer disease. You might have the positive, you might have all suggestive things, but 
that, that doesn't mean that you have the ulcer. So the only thing that can indicate you have ulcer is in that upper endoscopy that will, indicate, will, will show that you actually have the, the ulcer. So going on, let's look at the, uh, the management of PUD. And when you are talking about the management of PUD, there are certain goals, always what we call, we call the primary goals that you have to meet when you are managing this. And the course of the treatment will depend solely uh, on, on, on what is causing the, the, the ulcer. So identification of the cause is the paramount, is paramount in, in proper management of ulcer. And when you are doing this, the primary goals will include the following. One is to provide pain relief because most of the time is the pain that brings the patient to the, to the hospital. So, and we do this by giving uh, anti-acid and also you can give something, a medication that have a mucosaline protector. You basically, you take it and it, when it gets to the stomach, it form a mucoid layer on the lining of the stomach, making sure that you are not subjected to those uh, destructive forces in the stomach. The second goal uh, of management is to eradicate the H. pylori infection. As you have seen, it is the most common cause of uh, uh, peptic ulcers. And to do this, you'll be given two antibiotics and one acid suppr uh, suppr suppressor. Uh, normally, they call it this a kit. Uh, you may be given a kit as a one, 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 one medication, or you may be given as uh, individual medication, which works as well. Then there's that uh, goal is to heal the ulcer. And we are talking about healing ulcer by eradicating the infection and protect until ulcer heals. Meaning that when we eradicate the H. pylori infection, we have to follow you up in terms of protecting that ulcer until it is heals. You might be cleared of H. pylori infection. You might, we might uh, be su successful in suppressing the acid, but we have to continue for a period of time to give that ulcer a chance to heal completely before uh, uh, withdrawing the drugs. Another goal is to prevent recurrence. And we do this by uh, advising you on decreasing high acid stimulating force, as you have seen that it, it may stimulate or make the symptoms worse. Also, we avoid use of potential acid causing drugs like the NSAID that you have talk, uh, talk, talk, talked about. And in this case, we, we tell the patient don't self-medicate, don't uh, manage your pain by buying any uh, painkiller over the counter because probably you may subject yourself to this. Then you have to stop smoking. Then you have to limit alcohol intake. All these factors may, 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 may increase chances of recurrence of something that we are trying to heal. So what happens when you, do, you are not, you are, you are, you are, you are not managed properly or you have a silent ulcer, it's not showing any symptoms and sign, how can it present in terms of uh, uh, complications? So one is bleeding. And when you're talking about bleeding, the, the, the blood can be in the vomit or in the stool, as we have seen before. And something to be noted here is that those people who doesn't have the, they have the answer, yes, but they don't have the symptoms. Bleeding might be the first thing they see. They might, uh, they might uh, vomit and they see the blood and they have never seen any other side of, 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 of the symptoms that they were talking about. So this become now a complicated case of the ulcer, especially when they, they, they are done endoscopy and they are confirmed they have the ulcers. Then we have perforation. And this means that basically it means that the ulcer uh, leading to a hole uh, or it, it goes uh, on to form a hole or puncture in the wall of the stomach or the duodenum. And this uh, progresses and uh, is very, very, risky in terms of the emergency because the content of the stomach might now be in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the abdominal walls and it can cause harm to other structure which are near, for example, liver, uh, uh, kidneys and the rest. So this becomes an emergency and it mostly presents with a sudden, very painful uh, abdominal pains that increase intensity and the frequency. And then the, that complication is uh, obstruction uh, and the blockage is, is on the outlet of the stomach where the, the duodenal ulcer is mostly based 
And the, the earlier sign of this might be, might be vomiting, uh, which may be the earlier sign. And that's why probably when the, 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 the doctor is taking the history, might ask you in the nature of your vomiting or the nature of the symptoms that you're complaining about. Follow up. Uh, we need to follow up in case of, 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 of how the, the, the peptic ulcer have behaved. And in this case, in terms of the size, where, where was it, uh, the, the location, the cause of the answer, is it NSAID, is it infection? And then how the answer has responded, uh, responded to, treat, to treatment? Uh, how, are we forced to, to, to change the, the, the drugs because the, the response was, uh, was poor and the like? And then the, whether there were any complications. If there was any complication, for example, you need to be follow up. And remember, the symptoms can go away, the HPRL can be cleared, but the answer still there, it has not completely healed. And the chances of recurrence can be high. So the follow up become a key thing in making sure that your answer is completely healed before you yourself resuming to your normal routine. So with that, I think, I'm done and I thank you very much for listening. So in case you have a question, so this is the right time to raise it. Thank you.